or what do you think is the steps to gaining more confidence in ourselves when we doubt? Um, so I always thought that confidence uh, was a thing that you feel. And I have come to prefer that confidence is something that you do. Meaning that, you know, a, a lot of people, th a lot of people like to, to think, okay, well, you're going to feel confident first. And then once you feel confident, then you'll take the action. And that's wrong. It's not a chicken or an egg in my mind. I think what happens is you have to force yourself in a moment of self-doubt to do something. And when you see yourself taking action, the confidence mm. follows. Mm. So I have created my own definition of confidence, which is confidence is the willingness to try. And you display the willingness to try when you take action. Yeah. It's a lot like the relationship between courage and fear. You can't have courage without fear. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's acting in the face of it. And confidence isn't the absence of self-doubt. It's being willing to try even though you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's going in the book. I'm quoting you in the book. Make it, baby. Make it your own. <laughs> I love that. That's powerful. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I'm sure you probably, we're very similar in the sense that we do a lot and we build confidence because we would take action. You in law school and, and public defending and all these different things you've done, which like, okay, I'm afraid, but let me go do it and do it. And now, okay, I'm getting better. Now I feel more confident. It's not yes. just, it's not just let me learn something or let me read a book and now I'm confident in a skill that I haven't applied. I must apply it and fail a bunch and yes. realize, oh, okay, I've gotten better. I have fallen over and over and now I'm standing and I'm actually doing okay and I'm doing even better now. Let me build my confidence there. So Yes. And look, you know, here's the thing. I think that preparation and studying something so that you feel like you have an understanding of something can be an important first thing that you try, mm -hmm. but don't let the studying of something become the reason why you don't actually take the next action. Yeah. Well, I need to get my master's. I need to go to business school. I need to go to whatever, and then never actually do it. When you can yes. start doing something much sooner before needing to have all the credentials necessarily. Yes, there's very few things. Except for like being a doctor. Okay, maybe don't do surgery. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a chemist, a doctor, something that requires you to actually have accreditation course, and specialized knowledge, an engineer, whatever. But most things that you will master in life will not be mastered by reading a book. You cannot mm -hmm. learn how to ride a bike by reading about it. You have to get your ass on that seat and, and find your balance. <laughs> yeah. That's how you find balance That's is it. by falling. Because balance is somewhere in between not being on the bike and falling. Mm -hmm. or being on the bike and falling rather. That's beautiful. A great story about a bunch of topics. It's a story about confidence. It's a story about being comfortable in your own skin. It's a story about being yourself, no matter where you are or what you're doing. And it's a story about the power of your unique self-expression. And your unique self-expression comes out and is amplified when you feel comfortable in your own skin. I got into the speaking business, gosh, six or seven years ago. I had a TEDx talk that went crazy viral. That's what started the speaking business. And when I first got into the speaking business, I was really intimidated because I was new to it. And I wanted to do a very good job and I wanted to fit in. So I looked around at what all the top people in the industry of uh, motivational speaking and speaking on the corporate circuit were doing. And I noticed that all the women uh, were dressed in heels, wearing pencil skirts or beautiful dresses, the kind of thing that you might see a news anchor wearing, like a nice dress, heels. So I just wore what everybody else was wearing didn't even occur to me to wear something else because here I am trying to break into a new industry. So I look at everybody at the top, I copy what they're doing, and I am not comfortable in high heels. Yes, if my husband Chris and I are going out on date night, I can rock them like the best of them. But walking through a convention center in them, 
standing on a stage for an hour in a pair of heels while you're trying to hold in your stomach because you're being broadcast on a big screen and you're wearing a, a dress. Like it was the least comfortable outfit I could possibly wear. Very self-conscious in it. I'm not that graceful in a pair of heels. So I sort of like poof, poof, poof on a stage. But that's what I did for the first couple of years. So I was in Miami. This must have been probably five years ago. I was in Miami and I had just gotten off stage, take off the heels, take off the dress, put on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. I got like an hour to kill before I have to leave for the airport. I'm going to fly to Vegas because I've got a speech in Vegas the next morning. So I'm walking uh, down Collins Ave in South Beach in Miami and I walk past this store. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. I loved this store. And there in the window, were the most amazing high top sneakers I had ever seen in my entire life. I was like a moth to the flame. Let me show you these bad boys, because these are the originals. This right here, notice the gold shimmery sparkle and the confident blaze orange. I didn't own anything like this. I'd never seen anything like this. I immediately thought, whoa, this I bet is what like a Justin Bieber kind of wears. I mean, these are insanely cool. I went inside and they were pretty expensive. I'd never spent that kind of money. I wasn't a sneaker head yet, but I thought, hey, I, I, I spend that kind of money on a pair of nice heels. So why not treat myself to a pair of sneakers, okay? So I get back to the hotel, I pack up, I hop the flight, I get to Vegas. Now I wake up the next morning and I have a tech check, which is where you rehearse the speech and go through like all the technology rehearsals before the event starting. My tech check is at 7.30, the doors to the event open at eight and I'm on stage at 8.30. And I had a red dress, my heels, or so I thought. So I crack open, that's what I was planning on wearing. I crack open the suitcase, there are no heels. I have left the heels in the hotel room back in Miami. All I have are the Birkenstocks that I wore on the plane and I wore out in Vegas last night and my new Justin Bieber high top sneakers. And I have exactly 15 minutes to get to the tech rehearsal and nothing else is open. So Birkenstocks, Justin Bieber, I think we'll go with the Justin Bieber sparkly high tops. I slapped those puppies on. I walked from my hotel room all the way through the casino floor, past all the restaurants and the shops to the convention center, which you know is like a two mile walk. I was so happy to be not only in my red dress, but more importantly, in my Justin Bieber sneakers because it was super comfortable to walk there that way. I get to the backstage area and for the first time in two years, something happened. And let me tell you what happened. One of the guys that was on the production crew turned and goes, ah, oh, cool sneakers. That was like the first time somebody in production had really acknowledged me for something other than the job in two years. So I was like, huh. And as I started walking toward the backstage area, everybody I passed, cool kicks. Oh, those are cool. Oh, those are cool. And I'm like, this is wild. Nobody's ever complimented on my, like this is, like, people are. And so I did the tech rehearsal and then this was the moment of truth. When I walked out onto that stage, it was at the MGM Arena, and uh, there were like 5,000 real estate agents in the audience. I was there to deliver a speech for Remax. It was the first time I'd ever walked on a stage where I actually felt like myself. It was also the first time that I felt the audience kind of lean forward and go, oh, she seems kind of cool. But when you walk onto a stage in heels and a dress, you're like, the authority and you're on a stage and you're talking at people. There's something about walking onto a stage or walking through life and having something fun that you're wearing that makes you relatable and interesting and real. And from that moment forward, I have never not worn sparkly sneakers for work. I wore them every day on my daytime talk show. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I probably have 20 pairs of these. I love, this is my favorite, these are my favorite. Well, I love, these are my favorite because these are the originals, but I would say these are my second favorite because I like the low top, top and I love the blue. I love these. Um, 
which have a big silver kind of thing. These are super comfortable. And I've got a bunch of these, and these did not even come with sparkles, so I literally bought Swarovski crystals or whatever the hell they're called and got a glue gun out and put them on myself. If you're looking for sparkly sneakers, there's all kinds of them out there these days. It's the coolest thing in the world. The dazzled sneakers are a thing. Whether you go to DSW or Nordstrom's or Zappos or anywhere, you can find them. And so the moral of the story, the secret to confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. And the secret to being relatable and likable is being yourself and being comfortable in your own skin. And so whatever it is that gives you a little flair, whether it's a little pin on your jacket or a little flower in your pocket or sparkles on your sneakers or cool specs, you gotta like, you gotta, you gotta find the confidence to bring that to the way that you go through life because there's something unique about you. And when you settle into what is really an expression for you, you feel comfortable in your own skin. And that's the greatest feeling in the world. I have this saying about confidence that I've only recently kind of stumbled into as I've been digging into more research around the science of confidence and the skill of confidence. Because a lot of people think that confidence is a personality trait. It's not. It's actually a skill that you build through action. And a lot of people think confidence is a state of belief. It can be, mm -hmm. but that's not where it begins. And so I say that confidence is the willingness to try. That's all that it is. Mm. Knowing that you may succeed or survive, but you'll still try. And to me, all those people that we admire most, that's what they're doing. They have the ability to tune into those instincts mm. that are true for them. Because the fact is there's only one you, that's it. And you matter because there's only one you and there's only ever gonna be one you. And your instincts and your experiences and your inner wisdom is a gift to the world. And every time that you tune it out because of the habit of hesitating or the habit of self-doubt or the habit of worrying or the habit of overthinking, you are robbing the world of that gift that you have to, to give to everybody. Mm -hmm. And you can use this simple, stupid, silly tool to train yourself to not only hear it, but also to develop the skill of courage to act on it. Mm, powerful. And is there any area of your life where you feel like you lack courage still? Um, you know, I'll admit it's kind of easy. I think we all kind of go through those, those moments where you feel like you're behind. And I think social media is both an incredible tool and it can also be um, one of those triggers that makes you feel like, look at how many followers this guy has. <laughs> and like, I'm, like, I'm like so tiny compared to this guy right here. Like it's easy to right. use technology and social media, not for inspiration, mm -hmm. but actually as a way to bash yourself that you're not doing what yeah, other people are doing. Or whatever. Yes. yes. And mean. so I think that I, I, use the rule a lot for patience. I noticed that my insecurity rises up because right now, you know, look, I, I did a ridiculous number of speeches last year. I travel way too much. Mm. I don't want my life to look like that. Um, it's a champagne problem. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I also have three kids in a marriage that I love and I really feel depleted when I'm not with them. And yeah. so I'm practicing patience as I make an intentional pivot in the kind of business that I'm running so that I have more of a life that I want as yeah, well. Yeah. So that's one area. Um, you know, I, I, I don't feel insecure as much as, you know, you know the term deliberate practice, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the five hour rule where- Deliberate practice, is that from the talent code? Well, the deliberate practice is actually a psychological principle. I think it was in a book called The Talent Code, but yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a psychological principle that, you know, and you know the 10,000 hour rule. So, I mean, deliberate practice is in yes. sports. Yeah, so, so deliberate practice is this idea that, yeah, you could do 10,000 hours at anything and become an expert at it, but the way to do it faster is to uh, deliberate, to do deliberate practice, which yeah. means you're practicing with the intention of improving mm -hmm. and there's a feedback loop. Yeah. So, so you do just 2000 hours as opposed to 10,000. Correct. Right. Like for example, if you want to become an expert at guitar, <clears throat> learn scales. Don't right. just sit there for 10,000 hours and play the same song. Right. If you learn scales, you get the finger dexterity and the muscle memory yeah. and the neuropathway development. By the way. 
Yes, so I saw hard. your guitar over so there. So hard. <laughs> I saw your guitar. You know, I always wanted to play guitar, but instead I forced my three children to learn. That's good. There you, go. you just enjoy it. You just <laughs> yeah, watch them. Exactly. My brother's, uh, you know, the number one jazz violinist in the world. What? Yeah. And so I grew up watching the most incredible, like. Now, is he built like you, too? He used to be even like more jacked. They used to call him the Incredible Hulk of violin because he was just like wow, snap the jacked. thing in half. Is yeah, he, 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 he would. Playing. He would like slam it like Jimi Hendrix style. Yeah, uh, but now he's leaned up a bunch actually, and so he's yeah he's incredible. So I used to just be all awestruck by his gifts, and it was unbelievable his skill. And so I learned guitar. I taught myself when I was eighteen, just because I was like, I have to know something, you know, in terms That's of music. Cool. I can barely, you know, I'm like a hack, but yeah. you know, at least I could do something. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of in this mode of, <clears throat> of improving myself, and I'll give you one more thing that I'm working yeah. on. So yeah. I kind of think about my life and th- my work in three buckets. So we got this bucket here, yep. we got this bucket, and we got this bucket. And so when you think about your business, or you think about your passion, or you think about work, I think about okay. What do I need to do in terms of how much time and what actions do I need to take in order to develop the skills so that I can perform the work? Mm -hmm. So there's the deliberate practice that goes into practicing your skill Skill and your mastery. Yep. And your competency. Yep. Mastery. So that when it comes time to actually deliver the work, whether that's selling or standing on a stage or writing a book or talking to people or selling real estate or whatever it is that that it may that may be Mm -hmm. your passion, deliver. This is the one I neglected last year. Which this is? This bucket is, what are you doing to personally develop yourself so that you are the most capable, fulfilled, and satisfied human being so that when you show up to do your competency and your mm-hmm. skills and the delivery, that you as the human being are able to do that. Yeah. And so I've been spending a lot more time consuming content, reading books, watching, you know, your incredible show and learning from other people. And I think that one of the traps that we entrepreneurs get into is we, I, I, I was feeling last year anyway, like I was on a treadmill and when I wasn't looking, somebody was coming by and turning up the speed (laughs) and I was only in this alley and increasing the, uh, the the hills the, 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 like, <laughs> yes the... yes and so and if you're my age you need like a diaper when somebody <laughs> does that you're on a treadmill and a leash to the keep incline, you attached yes. to it exactly so um i uh i've been focusing a lot on this and mm-hmm. it's been interesting because you and i were talking earlier too about you going to india and some mm-hmm. of the stuff that you learned in terms of the different yeah. states to be in and i use one where i pay attention to where i'm feeling depleted versus where i'm energized and mm-hmm. here's the thing you can be doing things that are really hard that energize you. You can be doing things that are really scary that energize you. The same is true with things that deplete you. There are things in your life that are really easy for you. There are people that you hang out with, by the way, that you've been hanging out with for years, Mm -hmm. but they deplete you. And so I've been starting to become more deliberate about how I distance myself from things that deplete me and how I spend more time and energy either doing or pushing myself to do those things that actually energize me. And this gets back to your message around passion, right? <clears throat> right. And that, you know, the, the art and the skill of building a life that is guided by the things that you're passionate about. Yeah, that's great. And what we're going to talk about is confidence. What is it? Because a lot of us don't understand it. I know I didn't understand it. I had not the real confidence. I had the fake kind. You know, the really bossy, annoying kind, where it was really driven by insecurity. What we want to talk about is real confidence. The other thing we're going to talk about is the habit of self-doubt. The habit of self-doubt. So believe it or not, self-doubt is a habit. It's a behavior, a thinking pattern that you repeat over and over, and then it becomes automated. And when I can get you to understand that anxiety, worry, procrastination, self-doubt, they are all habits, then I can show you using science how you can break them. And then everything changes. And it all comes back to these five-second decisions. If you had more confidence, how would your business and life change for the better? I'm going to tell you how mine had when I finally learned what confidence is and what it isn't. Number one, I know how to say no. How many of you have a hard time saying no? You have clients you can't stand. You have people that work for you, that drain you. Uh, 
the ability to align your goals with values and actions. Fearless negotiator. Fearless. Greater self-control. By the way, let me stop there for a second, because I believe that in today's world, this is the number one skill for you. Self-control. And we're going to give you tools today that are going to give it to you. You're going to make a lot more money, and you're going to be a happier human being. Absolutely, and I'm going to show you how to do it. We can talk about change all you want, but I'm the kind of person that's about real advice for real people, and that's going to require some real action. So as I'm talking, I want you to notice what are the physical sensations, the feelings that come up in your body. When I ask you, how would your life change if you had more confidence and you have an answer, do you feel yourself shrinking? Do you feel yourself talking yourself out or raising your hand? Because if I can get you to start to isolate that pattern and that habit, simply in how you respond to whether or not you're going to answer this question, if I can break that right there so that you learn to try, I almost fell off a minute. Oh, good, there's a thing. You learn to try, thank you. I'm gonna like sur crowd surf right now, you got me? Okay. Then you can bring that anywhere. I'm into experiential learning, because you know, I got dyslexia, I'm ADD, it's really hard for me to read and retain. So if I feel it, if I have to do it, then it sticks. So let's talk about the myths and the truths about confidence, okay? Number one. Confidence is a personality trait. Total baloney. Total baloney. Lots of extroverted people that are really bossy and annoying, like I used to be, although I might still be a little annoying, <laughs> um, but really insecure. Really insecure. There's a lot of introverted folks that feel uncomfortable putting themselves out there, but they're, they, they really believe in what they're saying. So confidence is not a personality trait. Confidence is fixed. That's not true. You could be the most confident person in the world, and the person that you love leaves you. That's going to rock confidence. You could be a really great business person and then make a really bad decision and blow it all. That's going to rock you. Number three, that confidence starts with belief. This is where I go against so many other people. I actually believe that this is not true. I think that thinking positive thoughts will certainly make you feel better in the moment, but it's not going to create change that you want. That you can be a negative, frustrated, depressed, anxiety-ridden son of a gun, and you can still take action. And that taking action is key. You see, here's the truth about confidence. First of all, it's not a skill, it's a trait. And that's good news. I mean, excuse me, it's not a trait. Oh, it's a skill, it's not a trait. See, dyslexia on full display, I was not lying about that. <laughs> Confidence is a skill, it's not a trait. Confidence is situational. So there are areas of your life where you are confident, and then there are areas of your life where you have a ton of doubt. And here's the most important one. Confidence begins with action. Now, this is not something that I made up, and in a second I'm going to show you the science. I want you to write this quote down. If you have a problem that can be solved with action, you don't have a problem. So a lot of us talk about the problems that we have, but they're actually not problems. We're stuck in one of the traps of self-doubt. And that's what we're going to be talking about in just a second. But first, I want to show you how you build confidence. And let's, let's look at the research because there's really, really strong research on this. If you want more information on this, just Google the confidence competency loop. The confidence competency loop. Let me show you what this is. So basically, if you try something, he's either going to succeed or he's going to survive. Now, what happens if you survive it? Like, you really blow it, but you survive it. Well, you learn something. And then when you learn something, what are you doing? You're building skills. And when you're building skills at something, what are you gaining? Competency. All competency means is that by learning something over and over and over again, you have to do less thinking about it, so you don't have time to get anxious. Just like me in the bed. I had time to lay there, so I was thinking about all my problems. The more you do something, the more that you try, the more you build skill and competency, and that is where confidence comes. So I want you to walk out of here not only with the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Catch yourself when you feel yourself shrinking. Catch yourself when you feel yourself 
editing yourself or silencing yourself. I also want you to walk out of here with a brand new definition of confidence, which I'm going to give to you in a second. Because check this out. All of us are going to feel failure. Let me show you what happens when you are afraid of failing, when you're, when you're fearing it. First of all, you're going to start thinking, aren't you? Ooh, I don't know if I want to give a speech. I might be really bad at it. And then I don't know what I want to talk about. And I'm not really sure. Am I ready? Am I not ready? Should I wear the tennis shoes? Should I wear the heels? Should I not do this? Should I do this? And then, of course, as you think, you're going to start to doubt yourself. And this becomes this loop. This is what um, researchers call a habit loop. We're going to get more into this. This is a chunk of behavior that gets encoded in this part of your brain. You see, you don't, you're not a doubter. You have a habit of doing it. The same is true, by the way, when you feel nervous. You start overthinking. The same is true when you start feeling insecure. The same is true when you feel like a fake. The same is true when you start to get overwhelmed. The same is true when you start to fear rejection. All of those things, normal. It's normal to be afraid of being rejected. It sucks. It's normal to feel nervous. These feelings are normal. Acting nervous is a choice. There's only one way to break a habit loop. You have to insert a different behavior. Pretty neat, huh? See, we spend way too much time with the red arrows. I got to be fearless. I can't, never, I can't ever worry. I, I, you know, I, it's terrible to feel like a fake. No, it's not. It's normal. In fact, you're going to. When you first relaunch your eco-adventure company, you're going to feel like a fake. That is normal. Acting like one is a choice. So the only way to break the habit of self-doubt and thinking is to take action. And what action are you going to take? Five, four, three, two, one. And that, if you do it over and over, puts a new habit in place. This is how you build confidence, one five-second decision at a time. Let me show you a little bit more science. So right here is your, your brain. And the red part right there, that's the basal ganglia. That's where all your habit loops get encoded. Everything that you do that you don't think about. Worrying. Let me give you another example. Um, when you put on your pants, do you put your right or your left leg in first? You're thinking about it, aren't you? You don't when you pull your jeans on. It's a pattern of behavior that is right here. Here's the other problem. This is also where worry is. This is where anxiety is. This is where depression is. This is where self-doubt is. It's all right here. This is where procrastination is. What happens when you go five, four, three, two, one, is you activate the prefrontal cortex, which you know is the part of the brain that you need for strategic thinking, for acting with courage, for changing. So the truth is, in five seconds, you can change anything, and that changes everything. And I want you to understand that to feel more confident about the things that you want to do in your next chapter, it begins with being willing to try. So if confidence is the decision to try, because I also like the idea of you not thinking that the big topics like confidence are about how you feel. I want to make them action-based. Because you can't control how you feel at times, but you can always choose how you act. So if confidence is the decision to try, Here's the definition of self-doubt. It's the decision not to. See, one of the things that I've come to realize is that when you talk about self-doubt, it's such a big term that you tend to think that it's just nothing that you can control. But what if you started to consider that self-doubt is actually a decision? It's going to give you a lot of power. Now remember, I told you that your doubts create mountains and your actions move them. So let me show you the four traps of self-doubt. This is really incredible stuff. So the four traps of self-doubt, because I just said confidence is about an action, self-doubt is a decision not to try, and there are four ways, four actions that we all engage in that are you deciding not to try. Here they are. Hesitating. Hiding. Hypercritical. And helplessness. So I'm going to unpack these for you, and I want you to be thinking for a minute. I want you to think about that next chapter. And as I roll these out, I want you to think about, are you stuck in this? And by the way, 
I, I can relate to every single one of these. So when I think about the next chapter of getting into throwing events and, and creating more and more courses and doing bigger and bigger things, I can see myself in every single one of these, okay? Your self-confidence is in the gutter. You believe some garbage about yourself. You think you're a bad person or you're unworthy or you're ugly or nobody likes you or how about this one? This was the story of my life. I have f***ed up my life so badly, I might as well just flush it down the toilet. You have some narrative in your mind that is so negative that when you look in the mirror, you see somebody worth trashing. You see what's wrong. You pick apart your appearance. And I wanna reverse that because here's the deal about self-confidence. Self-confidence begins with you. You realize the word self is in there, right? I can't give you confidence. I can give you a little boost. I can give you tools. I can encourage you, but confidence is forged in fire. It's something that's within you. And here's the thing I want you to realize about confidence. You are a confident person. That's why you miss feeling that way. You can only miss what you know. You've just been blocked from the feeling of it. And wherever you are right now in your life, I'm telling you, confidence is in there. You just got to figure out how to tap into it. And you've been building confidence all along, by the way. Every time that you have fallen on your face or you've tried something and failed or you've gone out and thought you found the love of your life and then your heart's broken and then you pick yourself up again and then you dust yourself, you're building confidence the entire time because confidence is not built on the high days. Confidence is built on the low ones. Confidence is built when you are struggling. Because when you see yourself go for something and fall, when you see yourself try and get knocked down, when you see yourself stand back up after getting abused or traumatized or discriminated against and moving ahead, you are building this reserve within yourself where you know you can rely on yourself. You know you can face hard things and you can keep moving forward. You know you have your own back. So it's in there. Your life has been helping you build it. Now you got to just dig in and tap into it and use it to shut that critic up in your head. So the way you're going to do that is every morning, I'm not kidding, you're going to raise your hand in the mirror and high five yourself. Look at how many people are doing this. You're not the only one. For five mornings in a row, I want you to high five yourself. And when you do this, I want you to use the hashtag high five challenge. You know what's happening when you raise your hand up in the mirror? You are taking the lifetime positive association that you have with cheering for other people, believing in other people, uh, celebrating other people, saying, let's go to other people. And you are marrying that positive association with your reflection. It is impossible to raise your hand in the mirror and go, I suck. You can't do it because your brain and the subconscious sees this and thinks, let's go, I love you, I believe in you. And when you do this every single morning, something incredible happens. First of all, you're not gonna leave your bathroom feeling like you're dragging a boulder. You're gonna leave there feeling like the wind's at your back. Secondly, you're gonna have spent the morning, the first thing in the morning by taking a moment and being with yourself and not seeing your face and picking yourself apart, but actually seeing the person that's underneath the skin, the soul that's behind the face. You are going to shut the critic up. You're gonna silence your to-do list. And when you raise your hand like this, it also prompts you to think about the game you're playing. So now you got a moment to be like, oh yeah, yay me, I'm still here. I can make today a good day. In fact, what game do I wanna to play today? Just for me. So that's the first thing that you're gonna do. You're gonna high five yourself, take the high five challenge, which is high five yourself five days in a row in the mirror, take a photo of it, post it on your story, tag me so I can cheer for you and start to notice what happens. Something weird happens by day four, when you get out of bed, you're gonna have this weird feeling that you've never had. You're gonna feel like you're looking forward to seeing yourself in the mirror because something weird happens when you start to really be present with yourself. When you normally walk in the bathroom and you ignore yourself, you're alone. And I think a lot of us feel like we're alone in our lives. When you start to see yourself, you literally, oh, 
Hey, hi there, Mel Robbins. How you doing? You now, as you look forward, oh, hey, girl, how you doing? Hi, Mel Robbins. Oh, hey, let's go. I believe in you. Gonna have a great day. It's almost like when your neighbor waves to you, you're seeing yourself. You know, now that I've been doing this for a year, I don't feel like I'm alone. I feel like I've got myself and I've got my own back. I feel like this person that I see in the mirror is the one person that's gonna be with me for my entire life. So I better cheer for her. I better celebrate her. I better encourage her and love her. And that's what you're doing when you do this every morning to yourself. And there are mornings where I stand in my underwear at my bathroom sink and even I don't have a word to say to myself, but I can always do this and it always lifts my mood. And it is creating that deep connection within me to myself. And that's what builds your confidence. Confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. Confidence is knowing that you have your own back. Confidence is knowing that you can face something. Confidence is believing in your ability to face or survive or try something and be better. And confidence is being willing to try. And all of those things happen when you raise your hand every single morning. The second thing that you should do is um, you gotta be honest with yourself. If there are things about your appearance that are within your control, whether it is the shape that you're in, whether it's the health choices that you're making, whether it's how you take care of yourself in terms of self-love, and you're not taking action in those areas, the lack of action says to your brain, you don't care about yourself. And so what I want you to do is pick one thing, one behavior that you could do every day. The high five's one of them, pick another one. And I want you to practice doing it. And it's a behavior. If you think about the person that you want to become, what's that person do every day that you don't do right now? And when you start to do the thing that the person you want to become is doing, you leverage something called behavioral activation therapy. And that is a whole body of research that says when you act like the person you want to become, it's the most powerful way to change a habit. It's even uh, better therapy than uh, talk therapy because the action proves to your brain that you're becoming that person. You're seeing the change through the action. And so then the brain catches up and starts to relate to you like a person that's confident or a person who adores their appearance or a person that celebrates themselves exactly as they are. So try those two things. Make sure you tag me online when you do the high five challenge. And uh, I know it's going to work. Uh, first of all, does anybody have any questions so yeah. far or anything? Yes, right there. I love you. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. And by the way, let me, let me say something. This is also an opportunity to practice the five second rule. Yes. If you're sitting there thinking about what you want to say, use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, and put your hand in the air. It's a way to practice visibility, practice putting yourself out there. Thank you so much for doing that. All right, stand up so I can see you. All right. Uh, well, this has been very encouraging, so thank you. What's your name? My name's Jordan Lumen. Hi, Jordan. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question is, um, based off of what you've discussed so far, you've been able to dive deep into who you are. Um, how would you encourage others to become more intro perspective? More, what did you, introspective? Yeah. In terms of self-awareness? Yeah, I think in order to be successful as a leader, you have to be able to identify what your characters are. Um, or even, like you said, you were able to identify that you needed to get out of bed and you needed to do these other things, but it's easy to deflect at times yeah. where you had to really look at who you were at that moment, yeah. become who you are now. Yes. So, so tell me a little bit, oh, stand back up. First of all, give her a round of applause, please. Yes. So tell me a little bit about the kind of person you want to be. I would like to be a leader one day. Um, and what does that mean to you? And like you said, influencing others, helping to mold someone because someone has molded me into being who I am. I love that. 
I love that. And just giving back, especially to like new hires, because it's stressful and it's overwhelming at times. Like I transitioned from the lab and it was a small community um, where I used to work and coming to a large corporation and being amongst great people, it was scary and challenging, overwhelming, exciting. Um, but I want to be able to take people under my wing one day and guide them in the right direction. Okay, there's so much I love about you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How many of you can relate to any aspect of what she's saying? Terrific. Oh, wow. Well. So I want to point out some things that you've done. How many people that are in leadership roles right now are like, oh, we can get you involved in mentoring <laughs> people, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so what, you're, what you just did is really important. So Jordan, you just demonstrated one of the most important skills for career advancement, everybody. And it's something nobody talks about, particularly for women. And what I'm talking about is visibility. So the company is responsible for culture, for training, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. You are responsible for your own visibility. Visibility means, are your contributions known by the people you work for? And are your goals known by the people you work for? And based on all the research, there is only one behavior change that translates to a change in title or a salary increase, and that is increasing your visibility, which Jordan just did by standing up and asking a question that was both personal and by sharing what she sees for herself. Everybody in this room now knows what she wants, including leadership. And so thank you for helping me demonstrate what that looks like, because too many of you are working in secret. You should assume walking out of here, nobody knows what you're doing every day, because everybody's super overwhelmed, so they're unaware of the 47 things on your plate, they're unaware of the problems you're solving, and it's your job to figure out how to make things more visible. And one of the most important things is in meetings, don't ever leave a meeting without contributing something. It's a very visible setting and too many people sit there and say nothing because you're afraid to look stupid. You just said what you'd like. I'd like to be a leader someday. And I personally love the field of research called behavioral activation therapy. Behavioral activation therapy is some Big old word that means act like the person you want to become. Act like the person you want to become. That is very different than fake it till you make it. I am not gonna tell you to fake being a leader because when you fake it till you make it, in saying that, you are amplifying your nervousness and your imposter syndrome. That is very different than being intentional and saying, I'm gonna start showing up like a leader. Exactly what you said. You know, it's sort of like this claimed authority because how you show up does influence people. And so in your mind, if you think about kind of, if you were to take out a piece of paper, this is the simplest way to do it. You take out a piece of paper, draw a line down the center and just think about leaders that you admire and think about what are some of the things, okay, you just pointed to somebody, who? Uh, my manager, Ty, and my director, Cheryl. Okay, Cheryl and Ty, stand up. <laughs> Woo! Awesome. So name two or three behaviors that those two do that, that you don't do right now. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> All right, why don't you ask Ty and Cheryl for feedback right now? Can you give her feedback? Give her one behavior change. <laughs> On that, the spot. Yeah, why not? Let's go. Can we give her a mic? This is coaching, I guess, yeah. Yes. And I'm coachable. <laughs> Just one behavior change that you think would either raise her visibility or would have her uh, be more of a leader. I think being more confident in herself. What does that mean ability. to you? How would you know if she were more confident? Um, I think that she would, sorry, I'm nervous. That's right. I got an idea. Okay, here we go. Let's turn on the lights. Let's turn on the lights. Um, 
So I think that she would just take the action instead of questioning herself. Oh, great. Yeah. That's amazing. And what's your first name again? Ty. Ty, excellent. And then what's your name? Yeah. Cheryl. Cheryl, what advice do you have for her? I would uh, give her opportunities to practice <clears throat> her leadership. And knowing now that that's something she wants to do, we can create that for her and allow her to get comfortable and confident in, in doing so, right? And work on her, her skill that she wants. That's such a good one. And support question. her all along the way. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And she's already started, so she's leading projects to do what, exactly what she just said. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So why were you nervous? I don't like attention. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like? Amazing. Oh. Does that come up a lot for you at work? No. No? Okay. All right. Then I won't put you on the spot. I'll be kind to you today. <laughs> um, and Jordan, what do you think about this? I would say um, she hits it right on the head. That was my 2022 goal for myself. So it's challenging and you have to, like I said, dig deep into who you are. Um, but I would agree that's something I need to work on and it's, it's hard, but I'll get there. Yep. So for you, displaying more confidence is the skill for her to work on. Yes. Excellent. And for you, what was it? Um, just supporting her in her ability to either fail also and know that you're going to learn from that, but that we're here to get you, help you support. So do you see a hesitancy? Is she struggling with perfectionism? Uh, she's very professional. No, perfectionism. Oh, perfection? Her perfection, trying to get it right, scared to yeah, make a mistake. She's, she's a perfectionist, I would think. She okay. portrays that she wants that for herself, like to be the best at everything she, she puts her. How many people can relate to this? Yeah. You gotta get it right before you get it done. Yep, yep, yep. This, yeah. is, a, this is a protection mechanism. Perfectionism is not a formula for success, everybody. Perfectionism just means you're afraid of getting it wrong. And so you think if you hold on to it and you get everything right, that that's going to protect you from judgment. Mm -hmm. And so you two can sit down. Thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. I want to continue to coach Jordan because she's going to be, come with me. Let's go up to the stage. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Give her a round of applause. Are you nervous? Okay, sorry, I am. Okay, great. I love this. I okay. Athlete, so okay. I, I work best under pressure. Okay, good. I love that. So zero to ten, how nervous are you? Oh, like a nine. Oh, perfect. Or 10, maybe perfect. A Twelve. Perfect. Okay. How many of you are nervous for her? Yes, you feel I'm it. I'm sweating. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I wore a dark color. Okay, I'm sweating too. Uh, what else are you feeling? Um, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overstimulated. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything in your stomach, your heart? It's more in my eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> your eyes are crying? Oh, yeah, okay, cool. good. This is excellent. Excellent. Okay, so let's go on stage. Oh. Here we go. Yep. Everybody give her a round of applause. <laughs> Come on, Jordan. <laughs> okay, you're just going to sit right over there. Okay. Okay. All right, now I want you to look at everybody. Hi, Just friends. Just kind of take them in, take them in, right? Um, you're doing great. Thank you. Uh, zero to 10, how nervous are you now? Um, I see some familiar faces up here, so I'm feeling a little better. Terrific. Yeah, Terrific. I am. Okay, great. So I had to count for the five-second rule for oh, a moment. Okay, so you used the five-second rule to do what? Um, to calm myself down, overcome my emotions. Terrific. So what you're witnessing is something really important. When you stay in your head and think and you let the wave come, it gets bigger. When you move, the fear starts to lower. Now I'm gonna also teach you something really cool that you're gonna love as an athlete, okay? okay? And this is really cool. It's a way that you can use the five second rule in performance anxiety situations, okay? And this has been backed by research at Harvard Medical School. It is the coolest thing in moments like you just did, and you did it instinctually, five, four, three, two, one, you felt the wave. Mm -hmm. All you're going to do, as dumb as this sounds, is you're gonna go, I am so excited to be up here. I am so excited 
to be sitting in this chair. Go ahead and say it. I'm very excited to be here, sitting in this chair, getting this opportunity. Great. Say it again. I'm very excited to be sitting here in this chair, getting this opportunity. Do you feel your stress going down a little? I do. Let me tell you why, everybody. In your body, nervousness or stress is the exact same physiological sensation as excitement. Exact same. So what, what sport did you play? I was a track runner. Awesome. She's a runner. She's a track star, you know. She's a track star. Okay, see, now we're getting the swagger. Swagger's coming out. So before a race, when you're like stomachs and knots and you gotta go to the bathroom, your arms are fizzy, that's both excitement and nerves. Yes. So the only difference between excitement and nerves is what your brain says. When you use this little trick that has now been validated by Harvard Medical School, five, four, three, two, one, and go, I'm so excited. I'm excited to make this call. I'm excited to do this conversation. I'm excited to do this thing. You take control of what your brain is saying about the moment and it lowers your stress response to the heat of the moment. And so you can use that. And what they found in research is that when you do the I'm excited, you maintain control of this part of your brain which means you're able to focus on performing. When they did this in control groups at Harvard Medical School, the people who were taught to say, I'm excited, ran faster in track meets, they performed better in negotiation competitions, and they scored higher on standardized exams because you maintain control of this part of your brain. When you allow your nerves to take over, you were saying it, my eyes are going all over the place, it's because you're flooding your brain with cortisol as your thoughts are like, <gasps> like, a, you know, like a, when you go, I'm excited, I'm excited. Your brain's like, oh, wait a minute. We don't have to freak out right now. You're doing dynamite. My heart rate's down too. Is it? Okay, well, I was like, <laughs> I noticed her check her watch. I'm like, am I boring her? Like no, she's gotten really no, cool No, my now. heart okay. rate, I tend to monitor that. Okay, great. It's gone yeah, high down. Five. That's freaking <laughs> awesome. a hand hug. Okay, hand, hand hug. hug. <laughs> oh wait, is that that way? Did I do it right like this? Hand, I, hug. Hand, hand hug. Hand hug, hand hug. I love a hand hug. Okay, <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about confidence because this goes for all of you. I love that we're talking about confidence because again, we're in this lane of, if you wanna change, all you need to do is identify the kind of person you wanna be and then start acting like that person now with deep intention. And my recommendation is always start with your morning routine because it sets up the rest of your day. And the second thing, you got feedback about confidence at work. I wanna give everybody a new definition for confidence based on research, okay? Confidence, believe it or not, does not mean, and I'm gonna use the word swagger. It doesn't mean walking in like you own the place. It doesn't mean that you even believe in yourself yet. Confidence simply means a willingness to try. A willingness to try. And the reason why this is such a critical definition, particularly for women, is because there's this thing called a confidence competency loop which means when you try something, even if you fall flat on your face, you still learn something. You're gaining competence, and we know this is true. Like you became a, a track star because of how many times you tried. Every time you tried, every time you ran, every time you trained, you were learning something. And the more competence that you gain in something, the easier it becomes. Your resistance to it lowers. And so again, like everything I'm teaching you, it starts with the action, not the belief. The belief comes later through the action. I mean, what are you thinking about yourself now that you're sitting here? Um, I could see myself being on a stage like this um, amongst a lot of people. Um, the way I feel standing there asking my question versus how I feel now, speaking to a lot of people who may not have known who I was before I asked my question, I can actually speak to you guys without feeling as overwhelmed, which is nice. How cool is that? I feel that? like I have a lot more confidence now just being up here. And let me say where it started from. It started from a gut instinct, an impulse to take action, and within five seconds you shot your arm in the air. And that created this tiny little ripple effect that leads you in an entirely new direction. And so the other thing that I wanna teach you, because you had a question about self-awareness, and this is really important, everybody. There are two forms of self-awareness. There's awareness of self, and then there's an awareness of how you are perceived by others. And typically, we are only good at one of those things. 
And so awareness of self just comes from really spending time thinking about it, reading, uh, asking people what they see about you. It comes from trying lots of new things and testing out what feels right because you always have an opportunity to learn more about yourself. And like we've been talking about with sales too, it's about slowing down a little bit so that you can pay attention to what you're feeling. But the second self-awareness is actually the one that most of us are really bad at. And that's understanding how you're perceived by others. We're not aware of how other people think about us. And the only way that you are going to find out is if you ask. And so if you really want to grow, it's terrifying. Ask for feedback about how you can improve in these areas. Share with people, I really want to develop myself into a better leader. I am working on it in real time. What would you recommend in terms of how I come off? And ask for specific behaviors. For example, in meetings, what could I do differently that would communicate to everybody else that I am acting more like a leader even though I'm not managing people. And if you can get specific behavior changes that cue that to other people, now you've got a roadmap for things to practice. And then it comes back to confidence, the willingness to try. And then that takes us back to the five second decision, five second rule. Five, four, three, two, one is how you push yourself to try. And all those little moments that you try lead you in a brand new direction. Mel, have you any idea what it's like to hear and read what you're saying? but my mind is still beating me down. I know exactly what that feels like. You know, I know exactly what that feels like. And this is gonna be the last question. Um, thank you. Uh, this is one from uh, LinkedIn. And you know, this also goes to another question from LinkedIn. How does one keep the faith if confidence is an issue? This is all tied together because confidence is about your belief in self and your willingness to try new things and your willingness to believe that things are going to work out and your willingness to believe that through your efforts and through your attitude that you can make a difference in things. And I'll tell you, so many of you, you know, probably have followed me for a while, or if you're new uh, to following me, you see a 53 year old woman who's wildly successful, who is outwardly super positive, who's traveling around the world, who's impacting people's lives, who has a best selling book, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah. I will tell you, all those things are true. But it wasn't until April of 2020, at a very low moment, when I stumbled into this thing I call the high five habit that I learned the secret to truly loving and accepting myself. I have been very busy for the last 10 years, changing my life, building a business, clawing uh, our way out of nearly a million dollars in debt and going on to make more money than I ever thought possible. I have been busy doing the work to build that business, to get into therapy, to work on my trauma, to become a better person. But I never, ever, ever could figure out how to get down to the core issue that was making me unhappy. Because it didn't matter what I did, you guys. It was never enough. 111 speeches a year, becoming the most booked female speaker in the world, not enough. Uh, the five second rule, Self-published became the number one self-published audiobook in the history of audiobooks. Not enough. The five second rule book uh, sold two million copies, self-published. It's translated into 36 languages. Not enough. Landing a daytime syndicated talk show. Not enough. Celebrating 25 years of marriage. Not enough. Why? The reason why I never felt like anything I did was enough. The reason why I never felt like I could ever slow down is because I would look in the mirror and see a woman that was not enough. I would look in the mirror and focus on the things that I hated about myself. I would look in the mirror and I would laser in on what was wrong. 
And because I had that habit of being focused on what I hated about myself or judged about myself, guess what? That habit of self-rejection, that habit of focusing on fixing and on negativity, it became my default. I then carried that into my day. So I could barely even see all the amazing things that were going on because I was every morning training my own mind to focus on rejecting something I didn't like, focus on the things that aren't working, always feel like it's not enough. And if you stand in the mirror, this makes sense. Your relationship with yourself determines your whole experience of your life, everybody. How you view yourself is the lens through which you view the whole world. Let me show you something. So my lenses are clear. I practice the high five habit, right? I practice the high five habit. The high five habit has broken the habit of self-rejection. The high five habit, high fiving myself in the mirror has reprogrammed the default settings in my mind. Raising my hand and making me feel the celebration, making me feel the optimism and resilience to go play a cool game, the acceptance of where I am. It has fundamentally rewired my mind, everybody. I don't look in the mirror and see a human being I hate. Do you know how that's changed everything? I, I see a human being I love and that I'm rooting for. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean there aren't things every single day that go wrong. But it means that my resting mental state is compassion, support, and encouragement. The foundation of love. And that has fundamentally changed my whole experience of life because I no longer have this grinding sense that something's wrong or grinding hatred of the little things I'm doing wrong. I approach things with a sense of optimism, encouragement, and compassion. It's very simple. The high five habit clears your vision. The high five habit allows you to see things as they are and to still accept support and encourage yourself. I used to have an experience where I looked at the world with glasses on. Like when I look through these glasses, everything is shaded through the lens I'm viewing it. Everything looks kind of pink right now. The glasses that I used to wear that filtered the whole world, everybody, was what am I doing wrong? Everything's my fault. Nothing's ever going to work out for me. When you have that as a belief, you then look through the world. You look, you look through that filter and it shades everything. Everything's going wrong. Everything's my fault. Nothing works out for me. And so everything that I experience starts to feel that way. I miss a dentist appointment. Everything's wrong. I do everything wrong. Everything's my fault. When you do the high five habit, it's a whole different thing. I missed the dentist appointment. Oh, I missed a dentist appointment. I missed a dentist appointment. It's a fact. But since my mind is clear of all that crap from the past, I literally can look at that and say, compassion, empathy, understanding, love, support. I missed a dentist appointment. So I reschedule it. I pay the $25 fee. I can go through my life without adding the pound down that comes from years and years and years and years and years of telling yourself something negative. The high five habit helps you remove those glasses so you can see things clearly and you can see yourself and who you are is a person that deserves support, deserves celebration, deserves empowerment, encouragement. That's who you are. You are hardwired for love. You are hardwired for inspiration. You are hardwired for growth and connection. And it is high time that you start to see that and celebrate that shit. All right, everybody, I believe in you. Now it's your turn 
to do the work to start to believing in you too. I haven't lost anybody that I love. So I would not say what I'm about to say if somebody that I loved had died in this pandemic. But I have found the great pause that the last two months have forced me to take to be the greatest gift that I have received in the last decade. My kids have been home. I have been off the road. I have been forced to slow down. I have been reminded of what actually matters, your health, your family, your friends, what you're doing to take care of your mind and your body and your spirit, and making sure that you do something with the time that you have that you really, really enjoy. And the other thing that it's really made me stop and think about is making sure that I'm having fun, that my whole life isn't just work. And it's made me really start to think about the fact that I don't wanna go back to the life that I was living before the pandemic hit. How many of you feel that way? That this has been a gigantic mental perspective switch reset button that has boom, hit you really hard. I want to know in the comments, what is it that you, with this new perspective that the pandemic has given you, what is it that you want to change in your life coming out of this? I want to start seeing, I see people saying this has been a wake up call. I see people saying, yes, this has been a huge shift in my perspective. I see Brianna saying, I want to travel less for work. What do you want? Kelly says she's had a mental switch. Kelly, what has this pandemic given you in terms of the gift? Heather's saying, I want to ask myself, what do I really want to do? Kim says, I don't want to go back to the rat race. Brock says, I want to start the year uh, excited about it. Uh, I see somebody saying, uh, Larissa says a new business. Uh, Megan says, I want more boundaries. Tara says, I want to have more fun. What is it that you want to change given the gift that this pandemic has given you in terms of shifting your perspective? Dinky says, value my friends and family. Uh, Jealous says, take care of my mental health. Spend more time with family. What do you want to change, everybody? Seriously. What do you want to change about your life? Is it a relationship? Is it that you have had the time to take care of yourself in small ways and that's giving you greater control in your life? Do you want to change your job coming out of this? Do you want to launch a business coming out of this? Do you want to um, change uh, your timeline for achieving your goals? Is there some project that you want to take on? Because what you're going to hear me say over and over again is that the single most, impro most important project you could ever work on is yourself. And the greatest gift that any challenge will ever give you is a perspective shift and the realization that you can face hard things that you can survive hard things and that in learning more deeply about yourself and about what you value through the challenges in life, you are going to be handed a moment where you can make a decision. You hear me say all the time, you're one decision away from a different life. Changing your life does not take motivation. Motivation is garbage. Changing your life takes discipline the discipline to make a decision to change. You see, you need three things if you wanna come out of this pandemic and truly change your life for the better. So many of you do not wanna go back to the life that you were living. You see something greater for you. And what you're going to need in order to make that shift is you need clarity. You need the clarity 
to write the change down. And I want you to start right now. What in the comments? Let's get really clear. Terry wants to come out of this a healthier and better person. What is the clarity? Tell me the change that you want to make coming out of this. You gotta have the clarity to write it down. That's number one. The second thing that you gotta have in order to make a change happen is you've got to learn the skill of confidence, which is the ability to try something when you don't feel ready. You may not know how to do this change. I see advocate for myself. I see more physical movement. I see I wanna change my job. I wanna start a business. I wanna earn more money. I wanna travel less. I want my work to have meaning. I wanna get out of an abusive relationship. I wanna help people in need. I wanna make sure that I continue to keep the promises that I've been keeping getting up on time, working out every day, working on my relationship. This is fantastic because you're having a moment of clarity. And when you start to write it down, you are starting to develop the confidence and the knowing that you deserve to have this change happen. And then finally, what do you need in order to really change your life? Because it's not motivation, everybody, it's discipline. Discipline, to make small promises, keep small promises, discipline to take small actions when you feel afraid, the discipline to find the courage to push yourself forward when you don't know how. That's how you change your life. Just those three things, clarity, confidence, courage. That's all you need. And that's why you got me in your life because I'm here to push you. I'm here to encourage you. And I love seeing what you wanna change. That, oh, I see you need help building confidence. No problem, I got you covered. Because confidence isn't something that you feel. Confidence is a skill. Confidence is the willingness to try. Because it's through the act of trying, through the act of simply writing down what's the change that you wanna make right there in the comments. Just writing it down and trying it out, trying out writing what that feels like, that's going to show you that you have the ability to start to express the things that you want. And that's the first step to claim these things that you think about. Um, so for those of you, more than a hundred of you, who have written to me in the last week and who have said, I've had a huge perspective shift thanks to this pandemic. And there are some major changes I wanna make in my life. I wanna start a women's group. I wanna end this relationship that I'm in. I want to stop bashing myself all the time. I want to launch that business I've been talking about. All of the things that you've put on hold, now is the time to change. So many of you ask me, is it the right time to change your job after a pandemic like this? Absolutely, because if you don't hear the clarity that's inside you, if you don't quiet the noise and tune in to hear, if your instincts, if your wisdom, if your knowing, if inside of you, you hear yourself saying, I gotta get a new job, I gotta get out of this relationship, I don't wanna live where I live anymore, I wanna be near the water, I wanna be in the mountains, I wanna be out of the city, I you have to tune into that stuff. And then it's about confidence and courage to take action. That's it. But I'm also excited to talk to you because I am going through a major life change right now. And I consider myself to be a very confident person. Mm -hmm. And this major life change has literally rocked my world. And I am in a daily battle with self-doubt, with fear, and maybe you watching at home, you know, you've experienced a time or you can relate to this idea that you have made a decision. Maybe it's to end your marriage or it's to change your career or it's to move across country or it's to uh, heal yourself or to not have kids. Or in my case, my husband and I made a decision to sell the family home that we have raised our kids in for 24 years. I've lived almost half my life here. 
My parents, Lisa, never moved from the home I grew up in. My grandfather was born in the house and died in the house that my mother was raised in on a big farm. This has never been modeled for me. And so when I made the decision, everybody, it felt right. And I knew it was the right decision. But now that we're on the backside of it and we're a couple of weeks away from closing and packing this place up, I feel my heart shrinking. Mm. I feel these massive, like hot waves of anxiety. I felt waves of anxiety that feel like electricity. I don't know what your waves of anxiety feel like, Lisa. Do they feel like electricity or like, this is like lava coming through my body. It feels like I've got a beating drum in my chest and it's like, and it almost like vibrates throughout my whole body. That's kind of how it feels to me. Lisa, I have not felt this anxious Mm. and like scared in decades, Mm. decades. And so, you know, you wrote this book, Radical Confidence, and I do not feel radically confident right now. I feel like the Mel Robbins that I know has been knocked on her ass and I'm wallowing and I am doing all the things that I know to do. Get up, get moving, don't drink, um, move your body, reach out to friends, journal, go to therapy. Like I am so busy. Mm. I think almost trying to outrun the fear. Yes. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience But what were you going to say? Because I just saw you go. Yeah, yeah, literally. So there's this thing I call in the book about squirrels, like filling your life. I think it was the movie Up where the dog has like, you know, where the dog sees a squirrel and it runs off and then it sees another squirrel and it runs off over here. It's like they become distractions, but almost almost the distractions help you um, not to look at the realities of what is actually happening within you. So you even said you're filling your days up so much with almost these strategies strategies that you're trying to overpower the actual thing you're trying to beat it out versus actually letting it speak letting it have a voice and then addressing it with no judgment in yourself because that's the point though right you even said I haven't felt anxiety in years and so in those moments I actually go oh she's back again are you kidding me because I'm literally like where the what the fuck is this bitch doing here I thought I got rid of you in law school and I was like what Like, and so I'm like, get out of here. And now I'm going to like get busy and clean the house and do this and and on and on. And radical confidence is something else. And it's something that I don't think I've actually ever practiced. Mm -hmm. So I, you and I know the same, and I want to unpack this using my story. Okay. Because I know that there are times in your life where you make a decision, you're going to break up with that person or you're gonna actually say yes to their proposal. You're gonna change your job. You're going to, you lose somebody you love. So it might not even be a decision. It's something that's happening and you don't want it to be happening. You get a diagnosis, it's terrifying, right? In my case, you know, I make this decision. I think I'm confident about it, but the second the decision becomes real, I feel like I'm now a no. Mm. I feel like I signed up to go skydiving. And I was all excited when we were on the ground, Lisa, because you were going. And then Lisa's all excited. So I get excited. And this is great. And we're going to, Lisa and I are going skydiving. And we, Lisa gets on the plane and she's off. And I'm standing down there like, this is exciting. And then I watch Lisa go out and I'm like, oh my God, she made it look so easy. And then the plane pulls up and I'm like, it's my turn. Okay, I'm in. I strapped to the person. I got my thing on. And now I'm like, I don't want to do this. Don't let me out. Like, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. And I'm like backing away. And Mm -hmm. I, that's where I am right now in my life. Yeah. Right now. And so how can I face this situation and find or use radical confidence to help me navigate through one of the literally most emotional decisions I've made in my life? So girl, thank you for being so vulnerable and honest. Um, And in situations like that, the thing that I will say a lot is give yourself grace. Like give yourself grace that maybe some part, right? You're trying to push her out. Like, no, oh my God, I thought I got rid of her. I 
I tried that too. I really did. And anytime I tried something new, anytime I made a different decision in my life, she would come back again. And I would beat myself up over the fact that she would come back again. And so I realized, what if I just embrace her? What if I'm just like, oh, okay, you're back here again. That's okay. But remember, I'm not going to let you drive my, my life. You know, and kind of just reminding yourself that instead of beating yourself up, allowing her to come back and say, what is, why is she back again? What is she trying to tell me? So taking the negative voice that is the bitch and then saying, how on earth can this be my best friend? And maybe she's- How the to- hell do you do that? Because when that fear comes up, Lisa, it is terrifying. Like when you hear that negative voice and the negative voice in this scenario, I know it's so stupid, but I literally go, you're selling this house in suburban Boston because you're lonely. Your kids have left. You've been under construction somewhere else. Mm. You work here alone. You live here alone. This chapter of your life has ended. You are a ghost in an old chapter. It's time to move on, woman. I know that. It is time for something bigger. I know that. But when this fucking bitch shows up, Mm. she's like, you think you are lonely in suburban Boston? Wait till you live on a mountain, woman. You're not going to see anybody. Oh, you thought it was hard to work virtually during the pandemic outside of Boston? Wait till you try to watch a podcast alone on a mountain, woman. You're fucked. Like I literally, Mm -hmm. what are you done? What are you done? You screwed it up. You screwed it up. How do you, you have this no BS method. You talk a lot about the why. How do we use these tools in moments like this to find our radical confidence, Lisa? Yeah. So go, you've got to know your why you have to be so ingrained in that, that anything that comes your way can pull you through. So we've, you know, the negative voice, the fear is the ego speaking. The ego is trying to say like, Hey, I'm here. Like you don't want to do that because you're right. Everything you just said, but Mel, what if you don't have Wi-Fi up there? So it's trying to protect you to say, don't, don't do it. Don't do it because well, as you-, you just taught me something, Lisa, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, please, please. When I hear the word ego, I always think strength hmm. or I think um, being conceited. Hmm. I've never thought about the ego and the voice in your head as being something there to protect you when you're scared. Yeah. Never thought about it that way. So if I can understand this, and I would love to hear where you've done this in your life, where you've been paralyzed, that you have to, A, one of the key principles of practicing radical confidence, particularly in moments like ones I'm going through right now, is you have to, A, attach yourself to why do you want to jump out of this airplane? Why? What is the bigger thing that you're up to in life? that caused you to be pulled to do this, to long to do this. Have you ever had this moment for yourself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, when I, well, multiple times actually in my life, so going from being the stay-at-home wife, supporting my husband for eight years, cooking, cleaning for him, then um, helping Quest, like my husband, oh, I'm a good Greek wife, I'll help you, you know, and not realizing it would grow at 57,000%. And in that growth, having transitioned into oh my God, maybe I love business. Maybe this is actually something I love. The, the idea of tearing apart my identity of being the good supportive wife, this identity that I was told my whole life I would end up being, I got accolades for it. I got pats on the back for it. I was getting all the validation of what a great wife I was. And yet it wasn't fulfilling me. And yet it wasn't giving me the life I actually wanted. I hear you. So, yeah. um, and it, it wasn't, I heard something else. I wasn't sure. If that oh, was oh, 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 I Sorry. thought you didn't like you, you got somebody calling. No, 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 no. Um, so if it's not, it, oh shit, what was my line? Um, if it wasn't, I, I didn't, yeah. I don't know where we are here. Okay. Gotcha. I can do, yeah. Um, so I, I was holding my identity to the validation that I was getting. And yet, as Quest was growing more and more, I started to love it. I loved the challenges. I loved seeing what I was made of. And now here I was in a moment where my um, my voice is telling, well, Lisa, you don't know anything about business. Are you really going to give up this identity, the thing that gives you the accolades, the, the things that give you the validation? What if you fail? What if you you make a transition and you try this business thing and you suck at it? And what happens if you're God awful at it? Where are you going to get your validations from? Where are you going to get the pats on the back from? Where are you going to get 
the feel that you have now, while it doesn't make you happy, it didn't make me happy, but the validation and the feeling I got from doing it becomes the velvet handcuffs. So knowing that, I had to say, what is the life I want? So attaching yourself to the why, attaching yourself to this goal emotionally. So I started to realize I had the thing over here where I was supporting my husband and I was feeling good about it. But on this other side, in pursuing the hard things, in overcoming obstacles, Quest became a mission. It became, I was actually helping women. Like we were getting letters from women who were um, in the anorexic community. And they said, this one woman specifically, I remember, she sent us a letter. She said she was in the hospital at like 40 pounds, Mel. She was on her deathbed. Oh God. And she said, thank you for um, bringing Quest into my life. You have now made me okay with calories again. Now, when you hear that sort of thing and you attach yourself to the why, that when you step in, all these hard things to do actually deliver on this why, I now know I have to make the change. So I know my why now. I know that I really want to change from being the supportive wife into helping build Quest. All right, so let me unpack mine. So I, like you, it's it's interesting because your story went from you were the supportive wife for eight years, supporting, as many of you know, Impact Theory uh, that is part of the Impact Theory Global brand that Lisa is the co-founder and president of the Impact Theory Studios. But a lot of people know Tom, your Mm -hmm. husband, uh, because he started, you know, that show, you guys have seven and a half million people in your Impact Theory audience. And so um, you supported Tom for eight years. You guys are co-founders then of Quest Nutrition. And so you went from bucking all of the stuff that you were told to do, being raised in a Greek Orthodox family, you're going to get married, you're going to support your husband, you're going to have children, and discovering that you love business. And the impact that you were making and the fulfillment that you felt became your why. The why you were going to not do what society and your upbringing and what you thought you were supposed to do. Yeah. I have something that's almost like the reverse. As the more successful I've become, the lonelier I've become and the more stressed out I've become. And my why is to create more peace. It's to create more ease. It's to create more fun. It's to be much smarter about my business so that I can accelerate and magnify the impact without accelerating and magnifying the stress. Mm. And a big piece of me deciding that it was time to sell this house is because I race back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and jump on planes. And I am never anywhere, Mm. which is why I'm lonely. And it's just like it probably scared you to not do what you had been told you should do and had been doing forever. It scares me to slow down and to approach business very differently so that I can have all the things that I really want, which is more time with my family, more peace, and a bit of separation between the empire and the impact that I love building and the peace that I need and the connection that I need in my personal life. And when I say that, I'm like, fuck this house. I'm out of here. Back this shit up. Let's go. Right? See? Yeah, it all depends in the moment, right? So for instance, if we even know hangry is a thing, right? You don't eat, you get mad. And all of a sudden you may say something you shouldn't have said. So if we think, if we understand that one little thing by not eating has an impact on how we feel about ourselves. Now think about all the other things that come along with what you're doing. You're having to look back at 25 years or however long you've been there, right? So all of that is emotional, of course. And so now it's like, how do you separate why you're trying to do it with the emotion you're feeling? Oh, I love this because here's what I just got from this. The grief is completely appropriate. A thousand percent, Mel. The I'm fear so- is not necessary. Like the fear is something through radical confidence. If I'm able to separate the process of grieving, which is an emotional process that you cannot attach a timeline to, that is so healthy and so important. And it's also all about the love and the loss and the, like all of it. And you can't outrun it. 
And that is something that's really a big part of this major change is the grief. But what I've done is I've collapsed the fear of the unknown and whether and my lack of confidence in knowing whether or not this next thing is going to be successful. So if you look at that, mm. the why, right? So you've got the why. So everybody, the first piece of advice from radical confidence, if you are in the low, if you're in a big major decision, if you're scared about something, you did not lose your confidence because it's in you. We're going to tap into it. And if I'm hearing you correctly, step one, when you hit that moment is you got to attach yourself to your why. Mm -hmm. And my why is that I want to make a greater impact and have a much, have much more peace and ease in my personal life and more time with family and friends. And that's why I've got to remove this variable of a house that my entire family has outgrown, even though I don't want to give up the memories. Like I'm still yeah. walking around here because it keeps me close to my kids. Mm -hmm. And then you're also saying though, and this is the really important part that I've actually never heard anybody say. I'm sure lots of people have said it, but I've never heard somebody say it in a way that I really understood it, Lisa. And that is that the fear is your ego trying to protect you from something you're scared of. Yeah. And when you feel the fear, you need to detach it from everything else. And you need to turn towards that fucking fear you, you write this chapter. I'm so glad we're talking about this because this is my favorite cat chapter, everybody. <laughs> this is make your negative voice your bitch and then turn it into your BFF. And I'm telling you right now, my negative voice is my bitch right now. Like I didn't make it my bitch. It is bitching at me. Yes. It is scaring me. And so the voice that's scaring you going, I can't do this. I'll never make friends. If I was lonely here in Boston, then I'm going to be really lonely on a mountain. What the fuck have I done? I just for... Bitch, 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 bitch. My daughter has this right now. She got into this great program in London and she's pursuing her dream of being a singer songwriter. And she's five days away from leaving and her fear, so her ego is going, you're not gonna like it. You're gonna be homesick. This is gonna be terrible. Blah, 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 blah. So what do you do when that fucking bitch is bitching at you? You literally listen to her. You go, all right. I don't wanna listen to her. All right, Mel, she's I've been best listening to her and I'm crying in my bed. <laughs> How do I Here, stop listening to her? Okay, here's what, I love it. Okay, so here's the thing. Just like a partner, your spouse, um, uh, your best friend, yes. she's going to tell you the hard things. You don't sometimes want to hear it, right? I ignore but, Chris. I'll listen to you. So okay, okay. all right, so, all right, there you go. So your friend is telling you, you know, like, hey girl, you may want to watch out for this. Hey, you know what? This actually could be a bad thing. Like, what if you are lonely? So now I go, oh, She's actually a friend trying to warn me of something that may happen. Now, as my friend, because she cares about me, because she doesn't want me to get my ego dented. She doesn't want me to be embarrassed. She doesn't want me to feel shame or guilt. So she's warning me. So if she's warning me, hey, you're going to be lonely. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. Maybe I will feel lonely. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to have radical mm -hmm. confidence and I'm going to put something down. So let's say you have a list, right? On the one side, what is that bitch telling you? And now if it was your BFF, what is she trying to help you come up with a strategy or a tactic to mitigate that when it happens? So maybe here's the thing, Mel, maybe you do get lonely. That's very real. And now here's the thing. What are you going to do about it? You're going to say, all right, I've got a game plan. I've said, I've pinged Lisa and I've told her, hey, look, I'm actually really worried about going. I may feel lonely. Do you mind that you become my, you know, my partner in crime or whatever word you want to be? It's like, okay, yeah, of course, Mel. So now you can go by the fear and you go, cool. Thank you, fear. You've just warned me of something I, that may face, that may deter me from loving the new decision that I've made. Mm. And so taking that down, piecing it together, everything you just said. So even your daughter, it's like, well, I may feel, um, what, what if I get there and I miss my family? Okay, great. That's actually a very valid fear. What are you going to do if you miss your family? Instead of wallowing, like you said, right? And it's like, oh my God, I miss my family. You go to your cheat sheet, which is your radical confidence cheat sheet. And you which go- everybody, I'm making mine right now. Oh, I love I'm that. Mine right now. I'm turning an inner, I'm turning this conversation into a coaching session for myself, which by the way, I would have paid thousands and thousands of dollars for by the minute. Because if you can get me out of bed, it, not wallowing and terrified uh, of 
this big decision, then that changes everything. And I think you kind of just did. Yeah, taking that critic, right? Because I tried to stop the critic in my head. I tried to, but I couldn't. So I'm like, okay, what if I can turn the critic into my coach? And that's exactly what you've just written down. The critic is saying this, but your coach is telling you what you can do if you're fearful of this. So you've really taken this thing that used to be crippling. It was your kryptonite. And now you've made it your superpower. And the other thing I really want to hammer home, Mel, you said it and it's so beautiful, is the grief thing. This is so powerful because I think we live in a world where we think just because we're moving towards something we love, that we don't have the right to mourn the life we are living behind. Mm. And when I decided I didn't want children. I was just going to ask you about this. Okay. When you said that, I literally was like, I have to ask her because you on social media are such an empowering voice for anyone who has decided that they're not going to have kids. They just, just not what they want in terms of the way that you want to live your life. Yeah. So is there grief for you and how did you come to that decision for yourself? And why are you personally so vocal about the decision? Yeah. Thank you. And even in my decision talking, it really isn't whether I think people should have kids or not, right? It's really about when you think you are going to have one life and you change your mind. So I married Tom thinking I was going to have four. Like literally, I told him I wanted four children because I come from a big Greek family. I always loved the big grand family. And 10, 15 years in when I realized I love entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. I have a chapter called Open Up the Can of Worms and Embrace the Ick. Now, Open Up the Can of Worms is me asking myself the hard question, do I actually want children? And so many of us hide from asking ourselves that question or a question, a hard question, because the ick is what comes with the mess that is the hard question. So let's say, for instance, I don't want, do I actually want children? And the answer is no. The ick is now I have to talk to Tom, my husband, who may still want children. Now what happens, Mel? Is he going to say, well, babe, you promised me. And so it's a, you know, I want children or we have to get a divorce. I don't know. Right. That's the ick that you have to face when you ask yourself the what hard was the question. moment when you were like, wow, I actually realized I don't want four kids. What, it was, how did you get to that decision? So do you ever feel like it's a whisper in your head first? The house was. Yeah. It like becomes a, something it, yeah, keep going. So it becomes this little whisper that maybe we try to ignore because it's uncomfortable. It's like, I don't want to ask myself this hard question because if I say to myself, to your point, do I really want to live here anymore? Now you have to deal with all the emotion that comes behind it. You have to tell your kids, what if your kids are upset? Now you've disappointed your kids. What if your husband doesn't want to move? What, right? There's so many things that come with you saying, maybe I don't want to live here anymore. That ends up people living in the same house that they didn't want to live in for 10 years. So it's making sure that you ask yourself the hard question, listening to the answer, which is the whisper, right? So the whisper is, do you still want to live here? Do you still want to live here? And in fact, let me back up. So you listen to the whisper and then you let it speak. Do you remember the first moment and where you were when it went from a whisper to a speak? The interest. Interesting thing is someone else saw it in me before I did. I didn't want to acknowledge the whisper. And one day, one of Tom's business partners turned around and says, Lisa's not going to have children because he had seen me go from a supportive wife to now business. And I was like, no, of course, I'm going to have kids. I'm just going to do this entrepreneurship thing until I'm ready. Right. And so he turned around and he was like, Lisa's not going to have kids. And it was so upsetting. It was so upsetting. And I went to Tom. I was like, I can't believe that he said, who does he think he is? Why the hell did I have such an emotional reaction to it? That was the thing. I was like, because Tom even said, babe, why does it bother you? Who cares what other people think? And I was like, why does it bother me? And it was because I was ignoring the whisper and he just called it out because he saw in my actions how much I was thriving in business. He saw, but because of my belief system, the belief system that I had as, as a Greek woman, I was going to have children, I didn't want to ask myself the hard question. So when he said that, I actually stepped back and said, why do I believe that I'm going to have kids in the first place? Like with no judgment, assess my belief system. 
And once I started to write down what literally almost like, what are the first things that come to your mind? And I was like, all right, legacy, like, you know, like sh- chatting something out like as quickly as possible. So I was like, all right, legacy. And I was like, well, what does legacy mean? So I wrote it down, legacy. Oh. What does legacy mean to me? All right. Well, I said legacy because to me, it was about having children to pass on your wisdom. That was what my dad used to tell me. And I was like, but do I actually believe that? I'm like, well, a legacy to me could be, you know, having, um, making a mark on your life now so that when you're gone, you're remembered. All right. Do I actually need to give birth to my own children to do that? Oh, no, I actually don't need to. And then it was like, why else do I believe that I want to have children? I really love the idea of having a little Tom running around, a little Mm. mini Tom. I love the idea of having a daughter that one day I could help her mindset not be crippling like the mindset that I had growing up. So all these emotions were real, which is why I didn't want to necessarily say, but is this worth, right? Is this something I really want to have children over? And so once I looked at that and I said, you know what? I actually still want that. But what I want more than that is the life that I'm experiencing in business. Mm. And in that moment, Mel, going back to your grief, I realized I had to mourn the life I was leaving behind. It didn't mean that I didn't want the life. It didn't mean that some of the decisions I was making weren't going to be heartbreaking to me. But I realized that what I wanted more than having children was actually not to have children. Wow. And so I had to sit with Tom And we had a whole, as a relationship, our communication. And I said, babe, I need to give you the space for you to mourn the wife you thought I was going to be. That's going to take process. What can I do to do that? Right. And so I, with respect, said he's used to me taking care of him, putting his clothes out, cooking for him every day. And so there is a grief process when you lose someone, right? Those first moments where it's like you're surprised by all the, the changes. Right. So I said, babe, I need to give you the space to have this grieving process. So what does that look like? All right, I take care of you seven days a week. So next week, babe, I'm going to take care of you six days a week. And then the following week, I'm only going to cook for you five days a week. And then the week after that, I'm only going to give you four days a week. And what ended up happening was I embraced that both of us were actually sad that we were giving up this part of our life. But we know our why because we knew we were going to do it to move forward to the life that we really wanted. Hmm. And so giving yourself the space, Mel, right now to grieve all the things that are very true to you. But to have that why, which is where we started, but to make sure that the grief doesn't deter you from your why. This is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. I can't tell you how much I've gotten out of this. I want to try to unpack it because I think it's so valuable what we've just discussed. And as somebody who has spent a lot of time running and a lot of time being faster, I mean, even just think about the five second rule. Mm -hmm. If I move Mm -hmm. faster than the anxiety, I won't be there when it hits. Right. The problem that I faced, and it has worked for decades, but the problem that I've now faced in making this massive life-changing decision is that in those moments when you get the diagnosis or somebody that you love dies, or you make a major, one of the major changes, your anxiety catches up. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happened in this moment. And you've explained so beautifully and so simply how to practice this skill of radical confidence, particularly in these moments where doubt or fear or uncertainty take over. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.